Greetings, everyone. Pete Pardo here from Sea of Tranquility. Welcome to a very special edition of the show. We've got a great guest today, none other than guitar virtuoso, hell of a nice guy, Mr. Jeff Coleman. What's happening, Jeff? Welcome to Sea of Tranquility. Good to have you here. Hey, thanks for having me. I was just busting a move in traffic. I was hanging with uh, Reinhold Bogner. He, my amp blew up last night at rehearsal. I just plugged in and I'm like, oh, that's <laughs> I not called good. Reinhold. He answered emergency uh repair and uh then back uh i'm staying at a buddy's house and just just got back here Ooh. so yeah cool. here we are it's not good when the gear uh blows up on you right that's, that's thank god for good amp techs i mean reinhold's a genius and he and i've been friends for a good 25 years i actually got an old marshall modified by him it's one of the one of three that he had done and he had George Lynch ended up with it at one point and it was his amp and I kind of finagled and got it. <laughs> and then I brought it to Reinhold to revoice it for my liking. It was a little bright and, you know, for my uh, thing, but then he and I had a great relationship ever since, you know, always hanging and I can call him and take stuff to him and he'll do some mods for me. And he's just the coolest. So Keep people like that very close, Jeff, right? Yeah. And you know. <laughs> so uh, just got a new album to talk about here today. So uh, this is it right here, East of Heaven. Okay, out on uh, Marmaduke Records. Yep. Look at that lovely cream-colored Les yeah. Paul right there. Fender's going to love that. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I've been endorsing Fender since like 2007. And... Uh, you know, lately it's probably like a girl, an ex, not an ex-girlfriend, but you didn't break up and maybe you're still sleeping together once in a while, but you don't really talk about where your relationship is. Yep. <laughs> it's yeah. kind of how it is lately. Oh, <laughs> so, yeah. But, Did you use any Fenders on the album, though? All over the album. Okay, well, that's that's a good thing, right? Yeah. So, even but though you're not displaying that guitar, that guitar in the photo didn't make the album. Oh, so, really? But it, it looks just, cool, right? <laughs> I, was in, I was in Japan and I thought, man, that, it just looks cool. And I was in a Randy Rhodes sort of mood because uh, I actually bought that guitar on his, uh, let's see, he was born up December 6th. So yeah, it was in December that I bought it on his birthday. I want to make sure it wasn't on the eve of his passing. And um, yeah, I bought it for 200 bucks at a store in Shinjuku or Shibuya. Wow. Yeah. That's quite the like bargain. Seventh guitar on tour I bought. I remember Doug Rappaport was with me. He said, dude, are you losing your mind? You can't stop buying. <laughs> well, know? when you see a good deal, no matter where you are, you gotta you gotta go for it, right? Yeah. I ended up buying a gold sparkle V the same day and you know, carry two guitars out. There's some good stuff over there, man. I can imagine. I, so, I need to stay away from a place like that. So yeah. <laughs> So great new album, digging it quite a bit. Um, a wealth of styles on the album, which I think is uh, really good. It kind of showcases like all the facets of your playing. So when you, you know, it's 14 tracks on here. When you decided to make this new album, was your was it your intent to make it as varied as possible with so many different flavors? I mean, you got rock on here. There's a bit of shred on here. There's some gorgeous acoustic stuff, some nice bluesy, jazzy things. I mean, kind of what was the... Uh, I guess if you could take us through the kind of whole creation of the album and, you know, how you came to make it so full of so many different elements, which I think is really good for the listener. Yeah, it's interesting, you know, when I cut, decided to make a record, actually, you end up recording four or five tracks and I go, oh, I have a little momentum here. Maybe I should, maybe this is a record that I'm doing. That kind of happens. I think other people like Joe South Journey might go, okay, May 1st, I'm going to start writing a record and by June it'll be done. And, you know, cause he's organized. I'm just kind of, I just go with the wind, you know, like kids flying around and tennis practice, and, you know, the dog. And so I'm just kind of living life and I'm sure he is too. But um, once you get a few tracks together and you go, Oh, I'm kind of halfway to a record. Maybe, you know, let's see where this goes. It's important. I think let's see where this goes with, instrumental music it's not like like Ingve Malmsteen has to be Ingve Malmsteen to his fans maybe more than he should be right because it's never varied at all right for me it's like my records are sort of maybe a snapshot especially this one is a snapshot in time of the 2020 lockdown 
you know, there was times I couldn't sleep. I wake up, write a song like Insomnia at five in the morning. Okay, does that make the record? So to my friend Alex, he's kind of my litmus test because I really dig that. There's, there's a different harmonic thing going on. It's kind of John McLaughlin. And, oh, fucking. If you said John McLaughlin, I'm in. You know, and then you, so you get so many tracks together, then you think, well, is there a flow going on? Is there an order to it where it feels right? And, um, you know, in hindsight, I kind of feel like, actually not in hindsight, but as I was putting it together and sending it to mastering, I thought, it's definitely long. It's almost 60 minutes long. And I could get rid of a track here or there. Then I thought, well, those tracks, that one in particular that I thought maybe I would get rid of is so unique on the record. The darkness resides. I thought, well, that'll never see the light of day. If I don't put it out now, I'll never put it out. Right. And it's the only tune that's, you know, going for it acoustically and solo and really like naked, you know, but it's dark. Some of it reminds me of a, you know, the horror side of 50s movies like Abbott and Costello, where they go into the haunted house and, you know, and for me, if I touch on something harmonically different than I've ever done and something I'm not used to, I'm like, oh, I, I might pursue this, you know, but I just kind of do what I do and try to make the song, a, you know, a journey in some way. I remember Bruce Ignator, who was an amp builder, and he's from Detroit, and he's been a big fan of my music for years, and he, he kind of said, yeah, your, your music kind of takes me on a journey. The song, you don't know where it's going to go, and sometimes it might go far away from where it started, and somehow you figure out a way to get back, you know, to the, uh, to the plot. It's easy to get away from it. Oh, sure. Yeah. And lose the plot, but it's, it, it, you have to figure out a clever way to get back there. So, you know. It's, it's uh, therapeutic. I have to write regardless, you know. We're not in it for the money. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Absolutely not. And nobody was making money last year, right? So you might as well just, uh, just yeah. kind of go for it. Yeah. I mean, the funny thing is in the music business, the, the shit you make money on is the stupidest shit you ever do. You know, if I have a $20,000 payday for one day's work, I'm sure it's going to be something so ridiculous, you know. Not something that you're gonna go. I'm really proud of this. <laughs> it's some film cue or some random, you know, whatever. So that affords you the ability to, you know, make the records you want and and yeah. make money off our records, and it's been good. So good, good. And uh, you want to talk a little bit about who you got uh, joining you on the albums? I see uh, Shane is. Yeah, I mean, I can't not use Shane. He's just uh, he's one of my all-time favorite drummers. Anytime anybody's talking about great drummers, I'm like, yeah, you gotta listen to this guy, you know? And he's so dialed in with his tones. You know, you can get the equivalent of a, I don't wanna say this because it's sacrilege, but equivalent of a John Bonham, right? Where, but he's his own engineer. He can send you the track and it's, he has his own sound. that's like super rad, you know? And it's his own identity and his feel and, you know, the way Bonzo had, and you know, so many great drummers. But a lot of guys, I mean, if you send a track to Vinnie Caliuti, you go, okay, well, let me know what studio I'm going to. And there's the cartridge fee and <laughs> the engineer fee. And, you know, and maybe Vinnie would do it for almost nothing. But by the time you're done, it's like, fuck, man. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I always, you know, tend to use Shane. And he and I were born two days apart. We have all the same favorite musical tastes. And so, um, the other cat I brought in was Guy Allison, played with uh, World Trade, Unruly Child, and he was with Doobie Brothers for 20 years playing keys. And he and I do this big Japanese gig along with Doug Rappaport on guitar for this uh, Japanese artist. It's kind of like the Mick Jagger of Japan. He's the legend there. So I brought Guy in to play keys uh, on uh, XR7 tune, um, and uh, he's brilliant brilliant player not that many guests on the record actually paul shahada on bass yes. on a track and i had my friend carla buffa play accordion Ready? Yep. on uh, montecatini waltz a little bit of an italian vibe just to you know add a little bit of texture and she was very gracious to do it and am i missing anybody john o'brown yeah no, that's the last uh, thing. he's the other cat so john and i do a lot of film and tv stuff together he's the guy that you know helps me pay my mortgage. 
three months a year, I get a check from BMI and go, fuck it. Yes. <laughs> so we've been doing shit for like, you know, a good 15, 18 years. And I owe, uh, you know, a lot to him because he's, he does all the business and all that. And, you know, I'm just the guy that shows up and co-writes the songs. And so for those two tracks on the record, East of Heaven, which ended up being the title track and Hidden Dimensions, uh, he mixed and produced those two songs and played drums on them and keys. So, and it's interesting how they really blend in nice on the record. And I had sent the record to your uh, cohort, Bruce, or excuse me, Butch. Sorry, I'm drinking. Butch Jones, who I've been chatting with all morning. Bruce, Butch. It's all, it's all uh, good. And he's like, hey, he's like, hey, East of Heaven, uh, I really dig that track. So, you know, it's a little more cinematic and ethereal. And some of it feels like movie music, you know. And so, you know, space and it's not all just beating in the face all the time, so. Yeah. yeah like i said there's a lot of nice flavors and textures and things on the album and i think it kind of flows really nice um so you mentioned a few minutes ago you mentioned like satriani and you know when you think back i mean the days of the like instrumental guitar album you know are kind of long past right yeah but yet you listen to an album like this and it's enjoyable it sounds fresh it's not all about the hey look at me, you know, I can play type of thing. You know, how hard is it knowing people's taste in music has changed a lot over the years and knowing that people don't have the attention span for much these days, you know, how hard is it to create an album like this where, you know, you know, you need to grab the attention of the listener. You need to do it pretty quickly, but you need to kind of keep them along for the whole ride because, you know, there's not, not a lot of people in the world anymore who are like album people like me. I mean, I'm an, I'm an album guy. I like, if I get something like this, I'm going to listen to it all the way through every time I want to hear any of it. But there are people, you know, there's so many people now who are, they're all about playlists and singles and all that kind of stuff. So how hard is it to put something together in this day and age, like this album that you feel really good about that you feel is really going to grab the attention of the listener? Well, it's interesting because I'm not sure that it is. <laughs> Meaning, <laughs> anyway, right? <laughs> this record, I'm being completely honest, this record is going to test your patience more than another record that I put out. Meaning if you're a, like a prog metal guy and I give you a morbid tango, you can listen to the first song and go, fuck yeah, I'm in. I handed that track to my chiropractor. I gave him my record and, he, you know, I didn't know his musical taste. He goes, I, I didn't know what to think. I gave it to my son. <laughs> But, you know, this record starts out with a song called Loss, and it's just two chords on the keyboard and some melodic guitar stuff. No shredding, just tasty stuff. So, you know, if, if somebody wants to get in the car and go 90 and put it on a CD, is this the one? I don't know. <laughs> um, but, you know, I like it that it went somewhere completely different than the other records. So... I'm not sure, you know, the record comes out tomorrow and we'll see how, how it's received so far. The people that have been reviewing it are really get it, you know, and, and, and like the sonic landscape of it and the sort of things. Yeah. So, um, yeah. How hard yeah, is I mean, it? That, that's the impression. You know, I, just, I just enjoy doing it, you know, and I love mixing and, you know, I think doing film and TV stuff has taught me in some ways to, learn about space and you know different textures and it used to be just like okay one guitar track because that's what eddie and randy rhodes did you know and just and that's great too i mean eddie's the greatest posters of them all over in this room <laughs> uh, and that's great too so but you know it's nice to have layers and textures there's brian may moments on the record yeah oh yeah I, you know i sent it to steve lukather and he said oh mass exodus he goes, I, the, the, there's an ending thing where I do a little trill with three guitars. He goes, nice hat tip to Brian May. And I'm like, I didn't even realize I stole that from him. <laughs> you know, <laughs> meaning like that, because he's an influence. You know, Eddie's an influence. Joe Satriani's not an influence because he kind of, I'm so old, we almost came out at the same time. You know, <laughs> he put out Surfing with the Alien like 87. I did Schizoid in 88, you know. So a lot of people that are, similar in age to just you know we listen to the guys that the older guys came yeah, before yeah oh yeah yeah it's just kind of always that way uh but he's a great player you know so for the for those watching who uh you know maybe are not as hip to jeff 
you've played, I'm going to just name a bunch of them. Uh, you've played with Glenn Hughes. You've played with Phil Mogg and Pete Way. Mm -hmm. You've been playing with the Alan Parsons Project. Chad Smith, Mark Bowles, Asia featuring John Payne, Lou Graham. We can go on and on. I know there's more that I'm not mentioning. Um, in saying all that, you've obviously have a lot of probably really fond memories over the years. So any, you know, any particular time period, either, you know, even with Cosmo Squad, your, your, your band, any particular artist or time period or recording really stand out for you as something that's like, yeah, that was a pretty special time in my life. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because when we did the Mog Way record, which is Phil Mog and Pete Way, even though they had a previous record called Mog Way, right, with uh, the great George Bellis on guitar, yep. when I got the call to do it, it was going to be UFO. Um, put that aside, doing that record and being in the room with Paul Raymond and, you know, Phil and I had written a lot of stuff together. I basically got the gig. I wrote a song, got a call to meet up with him instead of, I thought, well, let me do an audition and play guitar in front of him. He played with Michael Schenger. I mean, come on. So I thought, well, I'll write a song that I think that he can just sing over and dig it. And I wrote kind of a Mother Mary type of thing that ended up being a Last Man in Space. There's definitely a similarity in the riff. And um, so he and I really hit it off. And I remember making that record up at uh, the... Uh, Prairie Sun Studios and Paul Raymond coming up to me, rest in peace. And he was just so gracious and humble and cool. And he's like, hey, this is, this is, he goes, I've listened to some of the demos that you and Phil have done. And this is really your guys's record. You guys are having a moment here. He goes, just, I just want to blend in and, you know, accentuate the cool things that are going on. And, you know, just, we're going to have a lot of fun with this. I just thought, I'm like 29 years old going, man, is this really happening right now? Because, you know, he could be one of those guys, hey, buddy, you don't know shit about music. And yeah. This is our band and this is my baby. And and Pete Way was incredible too. And, you know, it was so fun doing that record. I'm really proud of it. It sounds really analog-y. And, you know, there's certainly a, a little bit of UFO in there, you know, playing wise. A little tip to Michael is one of my favorites. But we went to some other places with it. And then I kept the relationship up after that with Phil and did sign a four and he'd come stay at the house and we made the record in the studio at the house and you know he'd do like two weeks staying at the he always liked the sportsman's lodge in studio city then he'd come hang out at the house and yeah you know, I come out in the backyard and he's laying on the concrete because he's from England they just love the sun he's just, he'll just lay there and just toast in the sun <laughs> have his Heineken next to him he's got shorts and work boots on <laughs> you know so uh I've always had, uh, you know, great memories with Phil. Cool. Great singer. But, you know, no, I would say that everybody I've worked with, I've been blessed that, you know, they're all wonderful. Glenn Hughes is, you know, we did uh, songs in the key of rock. It's interesting because I had a rental house and Shane and I built a studio in the garage. And basically there was like a workbench room that was separated from where you would park your car, which we sectioned all that off and, and we had all these rock stars coming over. You know, Billy Sheen came over and played some bass. Again, I just moved to California. And I'm like, you know, the guy pulls up in a, like a Maserati or a nice Ferrari. I don't know what he was driving. It doesn't matter. <laughs> but it was just cool, you know. I got my little minivan. and <laughs> But, uh, you know, we had these great artists come over. And I remember recording Glenn and I'm like five feet away from him. And he's it's just he and I in the room always. And singing all these songs and just killing it man he's like okay coleman today we're gonna sing two songs then we're gonna go get some fixings in northridge okay so he's thinking about the food like okay i want to get that yeah that fucking like, great ice cream pie i'm just gonna have a little because you know big daddy's gotta be thin okay and he just rip out the songs fuck man like hidden all over your face if you listen to that song it's like eight minutes long and it's just like the most epic rock meets r&b vocal it's like you know, if uh, he's a freak of nature, man, I'm telling he's you, a freak of nature, That's and sick. to sit there and hear that and sit in the room with that, you know, it's like wow, yeah. And there's never a, he couldn't sing out of tune, it's like Donny Hathaway he couldn't sing out of tune if he tried, <laughs> you know. And then playing live with him is just a 
because you're it's a mixture of deep purple then it's solo stuff and solo stuff's funky and i love to sing a little bit so singing harmonies together and then there's an element of uh danger in there where you go to these jam sections and you got to be able to hang you know you know glenn used to say he'd see a european metal guitar player with the you know the the full-on metal guitar that's all pointy and he goes uncle coleman look at this guy this cunt couldn't play funk at gunpoint because <laughs> <laughs> those cats can't you know they can't play the funk they don't listen to it i mean nowadays everybody can do everything it's like so many amazing musicians but back then you know it seemed like you had your rock guys you had your metal guys your classic rock guys you had your funk guys that were you know and nobody kind of does everything right, you know, right. specialties but glenn is just you know so funny and yeah and now playing with alan parsons he's a freaking dream you know it's just he's you know they're all great he's probably the most gracious of any artist i've ever played with and what a catalog uh, right that you get to play on a regular basis right i mean say you, that again what a catalog Alan yeah he's, and he showcases the band you know um and when I joined the band, I met up with them at um, Capitol Records. They were actually ended up winning a Grammy for a 5.1 remix of Eye in the Sky that he was working on that day. And the singer PJ was there. I come in the studio and I'd only been to Capitol once before. And, you know, it's Capitol Records, like amazing, right? And you feel so uncomfortable. You walk into a room and they're, they're obviously working and it's who knows how much it is a day to work there, right? Studio A or he stands up and there's like 10 people in there the wives and the singer and the engineer and this person this assistant i feel so like they know i'm coming but you just feel like you're walking into a private party <laughs> and Alan's like oh you brought some cds with you did you i said yeah i thought maybe i'd play you something because you know i had got referred from david pack from ambrosia he's like this is the guy you need this guy to play guitar that's it and um so I brought a CD that of me singing, but then I already had the Cosmo Squad more of a tango open. I thought, well, I'm playing that. It's open. It's, which one do you want to listen to? So we put it on. It starts out with a fast flamenco riff on the acoustic. And then it starts getting, you know, kind of heavy. I mean, it would be appropriate if I was joining Dream Theater or something. And I remember thinking, I'm just sitting on the couch and he's listening and he's kind of just sitting in his chair. And man, if there was a cloud over my head, it was like, this is so inappropriate right now. Oh, I felt like, I felt like Chris Farley when he was interviewing Paul McCartney. <laughs> oh. And, you know, Alan, was, and then it went like, you know, 60 seconds of a barrage of 30 second notes. And he's like, puts pause. Do you have something a little more, say, pop rock and maybe with a vocal? You know, I was like, yeah, this is, sorry, this was inappropriate. I just... You know, the shrink wrap was already off. I thought it was easy. <laughs> Please play something else. <laughs> yeah. So I played him something that was like a U2 with, you know, me doing my best Bono vocal imitation. And he's like, yeah, it sounds great. And then I came to his house for a jam and that was it. So. So you guys must be looking forward to, uh, you know, all this COVID stuff lifting because uh, you yeah. know, you've got plenty of plans for when you can go back out on the road, right? Yeah, I mean, last year was booked completely from, it was going to be my busiest year as, you know, while well, 2019 was busy too, but we are going to go into Spain for two weeks and do some festival shows in July. Okay. And then we have three weeks, I think, in the U.S., all over the place. So I don't know if we'll quite get into the East Coast there might be a North Carolina show, but I don't think like New York and this thing yet, but we're playing LA. We're playing Phoenix. Um, we're going on the Florida, Atlanta. We're playing the Ryman and, you know, it's a reschedule from last year. So Very yeah, I'm excited. yeah, little by little. How about uh, Cosmo squad? What do you, what do you have on the horizon for, you know, we have a show tomorrow night, the big potato and it's my CD release date. So we'll play a couple new tunes. And uh, we should, it would behoove us to do a new record. You know, we usually <laughs> leave at least five years between albums. <laughs> I tell Shane, by the time we're on our like sixth record, we'll be like 80. <laughs> <laughs> More metal than ever, like old goats. <laughs> uh, yeah, but uh, you know, I'd, I'd like to do a new record with him. You know, it's always, it's always a pleasure. I'm really proud of that one. 
you know, it's completely different than the, the East of Heaven, but yeah. Well, you guys uh, always keep people on your toes with Cosmo Squad, which is really cool. Yeah. 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 How so about you? What's up with you? <laughs> what's that? I said, what's up with you? What's up? Jeez, what isn't up with me? I mean, uh, God, I, you know, working a full-time job. This is pretty much almost full-time as it is to, um, yeah. you know, never ending, never ending. You, sure. guys, you guys opening up a little bit more on the lockdown situation or. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, it, it just, just started. I mean, now all of a sudden, if you've got your, uh, your vaccination, you can go to places without wearing a mask. All right. But if you're not vaccinated, you have to wear, but they're not checking it, of course. So I don't know. It's just, it's, I guess it yeah. depends on where you go and what you do, but yeah, they're starting to announce uh, shows around the area for this summer. Yeah. We'll see how it goes. Right. But it seems like we're on the up and up finally. So, yeah. So we'll see. Yeah. Well, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. I'm excited about, uh, you know, it's always, it always feels good to get a new uh, record out. And to me, I don't want to just put out like an EP or a couple of songs. I like the whole package, you know, I totally agree with you. Yeah. That's, you know? yeah that's and I spin cool. vinyl a lot. I find myself ADD and I'm sure they have studies of this listening to MP3s or digital information coming into your brain. Maybe it makes you want to switch all the time. Too many options. I don't know, but you know, I sit at home and I'll put on, yeah, twice removed from yesterday, Robin Trower, and I listened to the whole record, and it's like such an experience. Yeah, I'm not going to do that in front of my laptop unless I'm like exercising or something. You know? yeah, exactly. Well, those those things were created to be heard all in one sitting, right? I mean, that's all those yeah. albums. It's just the way it is. Yeah. Looks like we uh, looks like we have a guest. Oh, I wonder who it is. I wonder who that is. Him, right? I'm going to call him Bruce. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> here he comes bruce is coming there's bruce <laughs> so you have a new name it's bruce oh no <laughs> just kidding i was singing about something else and i misspoke i said bruce i'm sorry butch <laughs> welcome butch jones what's happening yeah how you doing guys good good we're just kind of chatting about uh potential live stuff and the album and glenn hughes and phil mogg and all that kind of stuff i was just gonna i was just getting ready to ask jeff about gear because usually i like to do the last half of all these conversations with some awesome notable musicians on this. so what what are you playing these days uh you know guitar he's, well he's got the beer going but uh <laughs> <laughs> amps affection you know, what kind of like your uh, go-to use a bit um look at that there John Cruz has done a lot of nice things to this guitar for me and figured out how to keep it perfectly in tune. And so it's a 59 neck Brazilian Rosewood fretboard, Fender Custom Shop. Uh, let's see, what's this pickup? This is a Arcane. And I have a coil tap on that. John Cruz uh, Custom uh, Single Coils. And this is one of my favorite beaters. I have one that maybe I prefer just a little over this one. It's the uh, the light blue that's turning green. The one that I copied from you. That's right. <laughs> that's at the other house. <laughs> Problem is, you get you, you own more than one house. You gotta you split your gear up to locations. And you're like, shit, where's that piece of gear? At? <laughs> I really need that, you know. But you you um, like low output pickups, humbuckers, right? Yeah. You know, when I was in Edwin Dare back in the day, it was all about EMGs and hitting the front of the Marshall hard. And then when I moved west and got that uh, old Marshall Warhorse that we call it, that uh, Reinhold Bogner modded for me, it doesn't like that combination. Mm -hmm. It's where I discovered low output pickups, you hear the tone of the wood, if you got a resonant wood guitar into the right Marshall, and if it's hand wired, even better, you know, and old, old Celestians and mm. they're ready to go. So I totally changed my whole thing then, you know, and even in Edwin Dare, I could get a clean sound, but it was a little generic sound. EMG sound good for the metal shit, but you go into the clean side and it's just kind of like a little sterile. Uh, I was getting into Stevie Ray Vaughan and I start playing these, you know, skank guitar. And that doesn't really work in front of, you know, a JC20 <laughs> with a BC Rich. <laughs> and a whole shitload of gain. <laughs> yeah. 
So onto the gear, uh, I there's a trusty old Mark II that I use. There's the uh, three channel war horse old. I think it's like a '73 Marshall, an old uh, you know Super League, and um, I have a couple Fender amps of Pro Reverb that I use in the studio. Um, I used a Hamer V on on the song Super String Theory, which is a Karina Wood, and I just love it. I think it's closer to the old. 59 Gibson V than what Gibson's making. Mm. Maybe. I'm not sure, but I love it. And, uh, you know, I always use Les Pauls. There's just some tunes that you need a Strat, some tunes you need a Paul, and, you know, they're apples and oranges. So, you know, other gear, Martin Acoustic, I have a, a triple O 18, uh, Kenny Hill nylon string for some of the acoustic stuff. And I have an old Yari Alvarez from like 20, 30 years ago that I use, you know, so. Well, you, you know, like, you know, we've talked about it many times, you know, you're, you're synonymous with tone, you know, especially talking on the electric side. Uh, I, I've told you and I've told other people, like, you've guessed it on so many different records. You know, if, if I hear a line, for, you know, a, a handful of notes, I know it's you. You know, without me knowing that you're on that track, you have a, a you know what I always jokingly call the, the Coleman tone. You you have a, a distinct tone that is that is uniquely yours, which is just fabulous. So oh, and, cool. and and it translates to Alan Parsons stuff, to Cosmo Squad stuff, to your solo, solo stuff too. And you know, from the heavy to the light, all of it is even on the acoustic stuff. You know, on your acoustic records, it's it's still you. It, it is you you just, it just resonates jeff coleman's tone so that's definitely a hand thing for sure well i wouldn't say at rehearsal last night i blew my amp up you know this because we texted and right. man, i couldn't get a tone with anything else like it sounds like michelangelo body <laughs> sorry mike you're awesome but it's just too metal for me with i couldn't no, the dynamics weren't there so mm. let's just get through this rehearsal yeah. <laughs> Text and reinhold on the you know called him and thank God he answered. So that's cool. And the amps back to normal. And yeah. Nice. Uh, other gear on that. Let's see. Yeah. The pedal. Have, you know, I have a Les Paul that I put original 59 PAFs in there. It sounds godlike. It's a Wildwood uh, featherweight Gibson okay. custom shop. And Greg Koch actually turned me on to it. They came out with them like five, six years ago. He goes, dude, you got to check this Les Paul. So when I went to Wildwood, I'm like, oh, shit. And they gave me like the bro rate for like, you know, five grand. It was still the bro rate, but expensive. Under eight pounds. Wow. No weight relieving. Yeah, life for Les Paul. Yeah. And then once I put those pickups in, it was, forget it. It just sounds like an old Les Paul. Real 59s. Yeah. Which is probably more than the guitar. Yeah. Uh, you know what? At one point I thought, I don't need these. And I threw them on reverb for like six, 5,500. And right away, somebody wanted to buy them. My mm. friend goes, dude, take them off. Put them in that guitar and trust me sell something else if you want the five grand but right. and it, i was like oh i guess you're right let's try it out first and see what it does because i was so happy with the way the paul sounded already had these peter green throwbacks in there Ooh. and they were great but it's a man there's nothing like the real thing i don't know what the hell they were doing in the 50s you know, doing shit right cars and you know <laughs> 50s and 60s, man, America had it figured out. It was craftsmanship. Yeah. yeah. Everything's you know, They cared with what they were building. Yeah. That's awesome, man. Yeah. yeah. That's cool. I That's always fun. use like the free the tone pedal board. There's a lot of the Tim Yarnig. Uh, he has the F Bomb 3 fuzz face. I use that a bit, like on Mass Exodus and a tune called Ghostly. And uh, yeah. So that's kind of most of the gear. A lot of the rhythm stuff I might be using the Mark II with uh, the culmination pedal. It's really tight, you know, heavy rhythm tone. So, what uh, what year is that Les Paul you got on the wall behind you? You know what? This is not my home here. Oh, okay. Yeah, just so you know, uh, I rented out my California house during the pandemic. I still have the studio there and all that, but uh, I have a nice couple from North Carolina paying all my bills. <laughs> <laughs> So we bought a house outside of Chicago, far enough outside of Chicago. And uh, half of my gear's there. 
third of my gear is at a studio in Agora Hills. And then I have gear at my studio in California. So the only thing in this room is, is mine is this baby. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, so this is a buddy of mine's uh, house and studio. And just uh, like, hey, dude, I need to do an interview. I said, come on over. I want to be there. But... <laughs> and he's like, and there's beer in the fridge. Great. Well, there you go. You got it all now, right? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> Did, did you guys touch on him uh, going out with Alan Parsons soon? Yeah. yeah. A little bit, yeah. We have, uh, I think, July 2nd, we're heading to Spain. Oh, wow. A Spain? Doing, yeah, we're doing, like, Barcelona. And he has dates up. I, I wouldn't remember all the, the cities. But I think it's a good two-week run. Oh, wow. Which, right now, that's like a lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the only gig I had done recently was... Um, uh, there was a benefit with Alice Cooper and uh, out in Phoenix. And Tommy Thayer was one of his guest players and uh, Brent Fitz on drums. And I played with uh, Lou Graham and John Payne in Asia and that sort of thing. And prior to that, I was supposed to do a gig with them with Billy Gibbons. And I had a bicycle accident where the tire left of the bike. I was going like five miles an hour tops. I don't even know how this happened. And I face planted. You know, it's kind of a similar thing I think happened to Juan Alderette, and but it put oh. him in a coma for six weeks. Right. And it's taken him a year to recover. And the crazy story is that my buddy Shane was just telling me that story when we were shooting the video. And two weeks later, bam, I'm with my daughter, and you know, and I jam two fingers. You know, you're holding on to the handlebars, and it's like a hammer fall, man. Yeah. You know, it's like the world just. <laughs> came out from underneath you and there you are and so i had to cancel that gig and that was like come on billy gibbons we're going to share the stage and play all these tunes and the crazy thing is lou graham had canceled he was maybe not feeling well so they added more tunes to the billy gibbons oh. so i had to play like 11 tunes with him you know wow but i know we'll do some more stuff together in the future but that was a tough one because I hadn't gigged in a while. I'm like, really? The first gig back, I'm gonna cancel with Billy. <laughs> so and I'm texting you to I'm texting yeah, you. He's like, time. hey man, how did it go with you? How's <laughs> the kid? Reverend, I'm like, let me get back to you. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Well, I thought what was the greatest gig you ever played? I would say uh man, I really love playing Budokan. Mm. I've been fortunate to play there 15 times now. And uh, it's, insane. it's just, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the coolest, like, five day week playing, I did, I played for Lord March, the, uh, the Goodwood Festival of Speed. He's now the like 11th Duke of Richmond, British royalty. And Brian May was the other artist. We did a thing there. And, uh, between meeting all the race car drivers and the show and hanging out with the likes of, you know, the Jay Leno's and the car auction stuff. And the, you know, the Duke being so gracious and staying in his house and meeting the guys from queen and, you know, all in the same week and it being such a different kind of thing, you know, and British royalty in the South of England, but not feeling uptight, you know, this guy is like a Hugh Grant kind of just cool, cool guy, you know? So that was just once in a lifetime thing. Yeah. And when I met Brian May, and I had met him previously, I was playing on G3 with Michael Schenker in the late nineties. And we came to Wembley and we're meeting Brian. And so it's, it's, it's me and Michael Schenker, Uli Roth, <laughs> Brian and David Van Landing, the singer, rest in peace. Mm. And um, so we're kind of having a, conversation and i'm just over the moon and i'm standing with brian may from queen and then uli and michael start arguing about something we're in a circle it's just us maybe we're going to talk about what songs we'll play later and they start arguing uh nit bickering about something then they switch it to german and it's like oh god this is so uncomfortable we're all just standing there <laughs> you know and uli's a friend of mine I, I wouldn't say michael's a friend we don't have any you know um so when I meet Brian 15 years later, you know, I walk out of the hotel of the, on the estate. And this is like from the 1600s. It's like Downton Abbey, you know, 
he's the only other guy waiting for the next car to come to pick him up to Goodwood. So there he is right in the sidewalk. I'm like, Brian, you know, we met back in the nineties and, and, uh, you know, Shanker and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And there was an argument and he goes, Oh, and whatever. And I, he said, I actually referred you to this gig. I'm like, get the fuck out of here. Wow. He said indirectly, what he said was, you know, it was the hundredth anniversary of the Indy 500. So started in 1911, this is 2011. And they wanted to have a guitar player come up, play Star Spangled Banner in front of all the race car drivers on the roof of the estate. And he's like, man, I played in the top of Buckingham Palace. And once, once you do one, he's like, I, you know, heights and all that, I don't need to do that again. He said, by the way, you, you know, might want to consider an American guitar player, right, for the uh, Star Spangled Banner. And I think they referred Dick Dale or somebody. And then Fender called me and said, yeah, you know, the, the Lord March is going to call and it's not a gag and you might want to do the gig. because <laughs> it's really <laughs> cool. And, you know, Lewis Hamilton, all the race car drivers, Dario Franchitti, Cat, Helio Castroneves were sitting at an eight person dinner table with these guys. Just amazing. Wow. I yeah. would say that's one of the coolest gigs, you know, yeah. it's just so different. It's hard to top that one. Yeah, yeah. So, and there was a whole bunch of other stuff that happened and whole another solo performance thing. I was an avatar and a part of this whole production. It was like something from Pink Floyd, the wall, <laughs> one of those nighttime shows where during the, you know, they have dinner, then they all walk out into the lawn and then this show blows them away, you know, and it ends with me doing this solo and then like, like fireworks and the, you know, the fireworks guy they bring is the same guy that did the, uh, the Olympics in England, and you know, it was one of those weeks. So, very cool. Yeah. It sounds like a very spinal. Well, I've heard this story before, but it sounds like a very spinal tap moment without the spinal tap moment. <laughs> yeah, so, you didn't yeah, fall I mean, off. That's to you know do some. You know, I mean, some fun gigs are just like just some random gig, and you know, at jamming at an after party with you know Chad Smith on drums and my best friend Dan singing. You know. <laughs> You know, we crashed some bar next door to the Emerald Theater after playing with Glenn Hughes. And I, I remember texting Chad the next day. And I'm like, man, that was a good show. He goes, ah, fuck the gig, man. That was great with your buddy Shrek. It, Dan, my buddy Dan looks like, because Dan can sing. You know, he's singing like War Pigs and shit. Yeah. The cramped little club. He's like, fuck the Glenn gig. This thing was fantastic, you know. <laughs> so that kind of stuff was cool, you know, the impromptu. And well, well, you know what? Now that you brought them up, any uh, any meat bats things on the horizon at all? You know, the chilies are they're knee deep in a record right now with oh, fish. Okay. Oh, okay. So I'm I'm doing good to get him to text me back lately. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm in your hood. Last time I was in his neighborhood, I'm like, get me back. I'm getting burritos. Let's go. <laughs> Ribbit, cricket. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Any uh, I guess in closing, just um. Any newer, younger guitar players kind of catch your ear over the last couple of years? Anybody like you, you listen to that you pay attention to a, a bit? Uh, yeah, there's a cat and uh, he's, he's Australian, but he lives in Nashville, Joe Robinson. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I took notice to him. I follow Tommy Emanuel. I met Tommy and played with him once in around 2000 and followed his career. And he just really took off in the U.S., and then when I saw Joe was on the bill with him at one point a few years back, I'm like, oh, I got to check this kid out, you know. Um, and then there's uh, um, Matteo Mancuso. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he's a bad motherfucker. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I like his plan. I need to get some of these recordings, though. It's one thing to see somebody and enjoy them on video clip, but I want to, like, buy the records and really, you know, that's what separates the men from the boys. How's the writing? Right. You know, I can tell both those guys have got it, you know. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's, it's crazy. You go on Instagram. It actually kind of freaks me out because everybody's like selling their wares. If you start glancing through, it's a little, I have to be in the mood to like, okay, this is what I can do and whatever. And who even cares? Mm. <laughs> so it's kind of weird when you just like flip through and you keep seeing people like pushing their thing, pushing. It's like, okay. You know, when they do a video every day or, I got to kind of feel it, but yep. it's amazing how much talent there is out there. And, you know, they can play. Yeah. The tech, you know, they're technicians. That's for sure. 
but an interesting thing. So my buddy Alex, he goes, you know, he was talking to the bass player from uh, Chick Corea. And he said, yeah, man, we invited this piano player. And oh, man, he, he's just insane. I watched this three minute video. It was just insane. So Chick Corea brought him in with the bass player. And, and he said, well, the point I'm trying to make is some of these kids practice what they're trying to do for like, you know, 60 seconds. I think it's because they're making like 60 second videos. And they, they can blow you away for 60 seconds. Anyway, they got to do a jam session with the real cats. And he said, after 60 seconds, it was awful. It just went like this. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a whole nother phenomenon you know people practicing being good for a short period of time mm. you know because the music thing the endless flow of improvisation for cats that re can really play that's what separates the men from the boys i mean that's where a guy like michael landau is just going to kick your ass i don't care if you're eddie van halen or who you are you try to jam with him for five minutes he's gonna fuck you up <laughs> He's just got so much in the, in the you know, it's yeah. not going to end. Remember Robin Ford said that. He goes, man, that cat can just keep going. <laughs> and like, you know, and build a solo and phrases and different yeah. things. And, you know. He's a freak. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny. I had uh, I had Scott Henderson on the show last week, and he talked a little bit about that as well, about how a lot of the younger kids, uh, that's exactly, you know, <clears throat> they, they're not going deep enough into the instrument and learning how to play. They're yeah. just like, you know, Hey, look at me now for this brief period of time. Yeah. 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 And Scott's yeah. one of those fantastic players. I mean, he's, you know, I've been watching him since the late eighties with tribal tech in Detroit. We used to go yeah. see them at the, you know, well, I can't remember the clubs anymore, but uh, yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So I keep on the lookout for the cats, but you know what you have to have, I need a, a player to have great tone. If the tone's not there, then I just don't care. <laughs> <laughs> yep. You know, I need, I don't need to be good. I need to be fucking great. I'm not going to eat, you know, Denny's when I can have the best steak. You know, <laughs> once you've had it, you can't go back. <laughs> so, you know, and a lot of cats are like, well, I want a guitar that, you know, I, they maybe they need it more compressed because they play more legato and, you know, Greg Howe from the, the Greg Howe camp, that kind of thing. And, you know, I'd rather fight the instrument a little bit more. You know, if I was producing a guy like Guthrie Dover, and I go, here, check out this Les Paul, he might go, ooh, it doesn't feel as comfortable as mine. I go, yeah, but listen to the sound. Okay, fuck this amp. Let's use this amp. Now we got something. Mm. It's really like, and maybe he plays less, and maybe the audience goes, well, I don't mind that he's playing a little bit less. You know, and but it's about the tone. And he gets a great tone. But, um, you know, yep. there's, just, there's different levels. When I listen to David Gilmore, even the later record rattle that lock i'm like oh god it's so perfect <laughs> so david gilmore you know yeah every yeah. everything is a state you know so so speaking of great tone check out yeah. the brand yeah. new album if you haven't out tomorrow right that's right so uh, they can basically people can get this just about anywhere right i hope so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the machine isn't broken yeah <laughs> East of Heaven, Marmaduke Records. Check it out. A lot of great playing on here. Some tasty soloing. Great, great record. Yeah, but really, really good. I've been playing it quite a bit lately, and it's yep. a, it's a keeper for sure, guys. So uh, thank you. I see you have quite a bit of CDs in the background. So yeah, I got a few. I got a few. <laughs> <laughs> I always enjoy you and Butch uh, going through the. You know, you have your top ten or your favorite records, and you're going back and forth and. <laughs> songs and yeah great well, people want lists man i tell you yeah list shows do well yep. yeah so i want to thank uh jeff coleman for joining us here today uh we really appreciate it and please do check out his new album uh, east of heaven and uh, visit us here on the web at www.seatranquility.org we're on facebook we're on twitter of course we're here on youtube all the damn time for butch jones and jeff coleman i am p pardo good night everybody